All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we are gonna give it a few more minutes just as people trickle in. Uh, so give us um, just a few minutes, but in the meantime, we'd love for you to let us know where you're coming from in the chat box. Folks are still trickling in. We're gonna get started once we have a, a good amount of folks um, who are attending here. So give us a few more minutes. In the meantime, we'd love to know where you're coming from. Let us know in the chat box. I see we got someone from Tennessee, Boulder, Colorado, Manitou Springs, Colorado. I've never even heard of that. Honolulu, Hawaii, that sounds nice. Yeah, yeah. some California folks. You got a good, uh... A good uh, uh, Susan DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio was my favorite baseball player when I was a kid. So <laughs> that name is familiar to me. All right. I do think we've got most folks here. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to today's quarterly GR update with our special guest, former IRS Commissioner Charles Rosati. Uh, please note that this Zoom webinar is being recorded um, and we will post it to the YouTube uh, later um, at a later date. My name is Erin Moser. I'm the Director of Education at NAEA and I will be your technology webinar moderator. Uh, so what does that mean? That just means that if you have any questions about Zoom or the Q&A or anything of that sort, you can go ahead and type to me in the chat box. Uh, we will have a Q&A session uh, later in the webinar. To ask questions of our speakers, we ask you to use the Q&A feature found on your Zoom client. Uh, we won't be taking questions from the chat box for this webinar, so please, we encourage you, if you have any questions, to use that Q&A feature. Uh, if you have any questions, again, about technology or NAEA, those we, we encourage you to, to type in the chat box as I will be monitoring that throughout the webinar. Um, and just as a reminder, you guys are already pros at it. I can see that if you are making a comment to the whole group in the webinar to make sure that you are choosing everyone in that chat box. If you just want to message the hosts and panelists, you can select host and panelists and that will direct your question directly over to me. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Michelle McCahey from NAEA. Thank you, Erin. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Michelle McCaughey. I'm NAEA's Senior Manager of Government Relations. And before we begin today's program, I have a news flash for you. Uh, for those of you who have been following our Minnesota Statute 332B saga over debt settlement uh, services provider regulations, the Minnesota Senate yesterday, by a vote of 64 to zero, passed our legislation to exclude enrolled agents and enrolled agent firms from the statutes of very restrictive regulations. So we are absolutely thrilled with this. Um, with the Senate vote, this nearly two year long effort to amend statute 332B is one step closer to becoming law. The Minnesota House is expected to vote on Friday or possibly Monday, and then on to Governor Walls to sign it into law. So we're keeping fingers crossed for these last two steps. Now, on with our program. Um, our GR update topic today is putting service back into the Internal Revenue Service, which comes on the heels of NAEA's new white paper on IRS reform issued last week. We're joined today by Thad Inge, Vice President, Advanced Goyak Associates, where he serves as legislative and regulatory strategist on a range of tax and small business issues. And our special guest is former commission, IRS Commissioner Charles Rosati. Uh, commissioner Rosati was appointed IRS Commissioner in 1997 by President Clinton and remained in this post for the first two years of the Bush administration completing his service in 2002. In 2005, he was appointed by President Bush to the Restructuring Commission, a nine-person nine panel to rec recommend reform of the tax code. So now I'll hand the mic over to Thad and Commissioner Rosati to get, on, get the program rolling. Great, thank you, Michelle. And I wanted to say a few more uh, things about Commissioner Rosati's um, 
background because he's had a long distinguished career in the private sector as well, really impressive. So, um, but thank you so much for being uh, here with us today, Commissioner Rosati. Um, so in addition to his IRS service, um, he, as I said, had a long career in the private sector. Uh, in 1970, uh, Mr. Rosati co-founded American Management Systems, um, and until 1997, served in various positions, including CEO and chairman of the firm. Um, AMS grew to become a major international business systems consulting and, and systems integration firm, and was one of the first technology services firms uh, to go public uh, in the U.S., he served on a, a whole range of boards uh, for uh, private companies and public companies, a few of which include Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, Bank of America, uh, and Merrill Lynch. Um, and he's currently a senior advisor at Carlisle Group, um, focused primarily on investments in the fields of information technology and business services. Um, and he is the author of a book, and um, I love the title of this book, uh, Many Unhappy Returns. Um, about his experiences uh, turning around the IRS. Um, and uh, he's a graduate of Georgetown University and Harvard Business School and um, received the Alexander Hamilton Medal, Medal uh, from the Department of Treasury. Um, and at IRS, as many, of, as many on the phone already know, uh, Commissioner Rosati was really considered a reformer when it came to upgrading the agency's technology. Um, as well as turning the IRS into a more customer service oriented agency. Um, why, one of the reasons why it's appropriate that he's uh, the speaker for our topic today. Um, and in recent years, um, in his spare time, uh, Commissioner Rosati has been working with former IRS commissioners such as Fred Goldberg uh, to advocate for improvements at the IRS. Um, he's testified uh, recently before Congress about this. He's a tireless advocate for modernizing the agency. Um, and all of his work um, around the IRS is really for all of the right reasons. It's, it's good public policy. He, um, you know, he's fighting for what he believes is best for the agency and best for the country and taxpayers. And so we are really lucky uh, to have him here with us today. And with that, Commissioner, I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to you. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Dad. And thanks, Michelle. Gee, I didn't even know if I did all that stuff, but I guess I did if you said it. Uh, <laughs> it just means I'm old. I've been around a long time, but I appreciate the invitation to speak. And, you know, I spoke to members of this group and enrolled agents, you know, many times when I was commissioner. But when I left the government almost 20 years ago, I never thought I'd be meeting or talking to you, to you again unless I needed one of your members to help me with an audit. Because, as you know, I'm not a tax guy, so I need help with audits if I ever have one. But um, I went back to my business activities very happily, and I didn't think I'd be involved anymore with tax administration. So what happened is that you know, a couple of years ago, as tax talk became prominent during the presidential campaigns, it sort of encouraged me to take a look at uh, back again at the, what was happening to the tax system and especially at the IRS, because uh, I really had not been engaged at all for over 10 years at, at that point. And then I started looking and looking, and frankly, I was shocked at how bad things had gotten with the IRS and the tax system. And I have to tell you, uh, if you're a former IRS commissioner, it takes a lot of IRS problems to create shock about the IRS because they come every day. Um, and of course, I know that probably everybody on this call you know, sees these problems every day in a very tangible way. But what I was looking at is the cumulative effect of the deterioration that had occurred over a period period of time. And that's really what created the shock. Um, as I say, you all see this every day in specific ways that you try to interact with the IRS. And I say try because you may not be very successful given, given what's happening. And I could recite some of the obvious things. Notices that are difficult to understand and often may have inaccurate uh, results. Uh, of course, the backlog today, the unprocessed returns, almost impossible to get through on, on phone calls. Um, frustration when they do put technology, such as trying to make self-service accounts work, and they don't work very well. And we could talk all afternoon on hundreds of variations of these kinds of things. Um, and I have to tell you that um, former commissioners are not exempt from these issues because just myself, I recently got a, uh, was assessed a penalty 
uh, was at least given a notice of an assessment of penalty for failure to make a quarterly payment, which of course I had actually paid, but the IRS had not reported it. So it happens to everybody. If you go up a level uh, from these kind of daily and very frustrating problems, uh, the deterioration in the effectiveness of the IRS and some of its basic compliance missions uh, is also very, very worrisome. And that results in what we now know is a tax gap that is so large, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine the numbers, uh, $600 billion per year and growing. Most people really can't grasp what that kind of, I've said that to the number that, you know, if I say that you uh, lost $600, you'd, you'd pretty well know what that meant to you. But 600 billion, what does it mean? You have to think of different ways to explain it. I mean, one example is that that's more, that loss is more than all of the income taxes collectively that are paid by 135 million individual taxpayers, almost 90% of the whole taxpayer base. And when I tell people something like that, who are mostly, of course, honest taxpayers, it means that their taxes were just blanked out by a minority of people who, who don't or won't pay. Uh, and that's, that's a bad thing for everybody. And I have to say the pandemic is part of this. It, it, it definitely made things and illustrated how, how much things have, have gotten bad. But, but I was looking at this even before the pandemic. So the pandemic just brought it out. Um, I want to detour for a second and mention one thing uh, because about IRS employees. Um, I think that most of the rank and file IRS employees are just as frustrated as, as, the, as the taxpayers. I mean, they're trying most of them to do the best they can, and they simply don't have the resources to do it. Uh, they, 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 they've even done some remarkable things like getting these economic impact payments out, but that only creates more of a workload and more backlog and other things. So they, they, they see the impact of that as well as the taxpayers do. So I tried to look at what is behind all this. And because um, I think that you'd pretty get pretty much agreement that these problems are pretty serious, but what is really behind it? And I think the most important thing that is behind it, uh, not the only thing, but the most important thing is a long-term failure uh, to invest in the IRS, uh, to provide resources and direction and, and, uh, and guidance to, uh, to, to modernize and update and, and, and keep up the resources of the IRS compounded with the ever increasing amount of responsibility that's being laid onto the IRS by the Congress. So it creates a gap, an enormous gap between the capacity of the agency and what it's supposed to do. And with respect to budgets, people talk a lot, well, there's been budget cuts, you know, in, in the last 10 years, 2010. Honestly, it's much, much deeper than that. I went back to 1993 which is quite a while ago, uh, and compared the IRS budget and its resources into, to what the economy is today, what the tax system is today. And the IRS resources today are less than half in proportion to the economy of what they were in 1993. And in the meantime, the number of returns, of course, has increased individuals in returns by 38%, business returns by 84%. Those are just returns. But even that doesn't get to the, to the problem because it doesn't talk about the really substantial increase in responsibilities that have been assigned to the IRS by Congress to administer a whole range of programs. I mean, there was the Affordable Care Act in 2010, all of these economic impact programs in 20 and 21. Uh, and that's on top of an ever-growing list of tax credits or tax breaks that Congress keeps giving the IRS to administer. And if you look at the Joint Committee on Taxation, they've got a list 129 tax credits for businesses and 179 tax credits for individuals. Every one of those provisions takes with it a whole lot of work to do regulations and administration and everything else. So let me give you a number that I found totally startling and I think probably you will too. And that is that in 2021, last year, last fiscal year, the IRS sent out sent out to people more cash in the form of benefits and refunds than the Social Security Administration sent out in benefits. And the IRS budget was actually less than the Social Security Administration budget. That's before you get to actually doing any tax administration. 
I mean, the IRS processed 263 million returns from individuals, businesses, tax exempt organizations, you name it. So that's what I call a gap. That's a structural gap. That's not a short term budget cut. That's a total mismatch. All right, what's the solution? I will say that your white paper has a good outline of the solutions, but just to, just to summarize it, um, I wanna say, first of all, there are some immediate steps that the IRS is taking and needs to take just to clear up the backlog. And those are the first priority, of course. But that's, even if they do that, uh, that that's, that's just uh, filling a, a short-term hole. Uh, it's really the long-term and, and, and that needs to be addressed. And I think that that requires three things from Congress. Uh, one is some form of long-term funding uh, not a quick in, impact of you know one one year, but something that is steady over a long period of time, which was proposed by the administration as part of their reconciliation bill, and that may be a form to do it. Uh, but in one form or another, it has to be a sustained long term program. Uh, they also need to have some authority to rebuild the workforce because that is a significant problem. Uh, the workforce has deteriorated. Uh, in, both size and, and capacity, 30% uh, of the skilled workforce has been lost just in the last 10 years. And in recent times when they've tried to do short-term hiring, it's really been very, very lacking in success given the labor market. So they need a long-term program, flexible capacity to hire qualified people. And they do very well. It takes years uh, to train people, especially in the more complex parts of, uh, of uh, administering the tax code. And then the other reason for the long-term commitment has to do with technology. Uh, there is no way that the IRS can succeed just doing this the way it has. I'm sure you all know that. Even if it had more resources, just doing more is going to uh, not, not be effective. It'd be too inefficient. It has to use what all big organizations use, uh, which is more use of data and more use of technology to make both their activities uh, more efficient and to make it better service for taxpayers. Uh, that, that's another place that it's shocking how, how poor or how, how low the level of investment in technology has been. I did a comparison for the last um, seven, several years um, of the IRS budget, the whole budget for technology compared to just some large banks. I used to be on one large bank board. I know, I know what they spend. The IRS budget for technology is less than a quarter of what each of those large banks spend on technology every year. Uh, just one bank uh, this year, the, the JP Morgan announced they were gonna spend $12 billion on technology. That's equivalent to the whole IRS budget. Uh, the, 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 the level of investment in the IRS technology is, is it would be funny if, if it weren't so serious. And that can make a big difference pretty quickly, actually, and in things that I know you're concerned about and how the taxpayers interact with practitioners and taxpayers, for example, make it one obvious one, make it easier to communicate electronically with, with, with practitioners, certainly, and also in some cases, taxpayers to allow more self-service activities. Uh, the IRS has programs to do that, but they've been, been underfunded and undermanaged, honestly. Uh, it can also be very effective in the compliance side by making audits more efficient and uh, better targeted. So there's, for example, not so many no change audits. I mean, the, the, as few audits as there are, many of them aren't directed well. Um, and I, lastly, I would say, as you noted in your white paper, if the Congress does provide funding, uh, it needs to provide some clear goals on both service and compliance, because uh, any, any commitment on the part of the Congress needs to be matched with a commitment on the part of the agency to actually use those funds uh, to, to, to make progress on both service and compliance. And finally, I'll make, put in a plug for your white paper because I did read it and uh, I think it's good. It's really good. Um, I mean, uh, I don't know whether I would agree to every single sentence, but on the themes and the major, major points, if Congress would listen, it would be a great step forward. Okay, I'll be glad to take some questions. Great, thank you, Commissioner, that was great. And um, I've got a couple questions I will start you off with. Um, so the, the current commissioner's term is obviously coming to a, um, coming to a close um, here in uh, November, I believe, and was interested in what qualities um, you believe the next IRS commissioner um, should have. 
I think that the that the most important quality for a commissioner in the IRS um, really has to do with uh, demonstrated experience and perhaps some level of success in leadership and management. I mean, those are two related things, but not exactly the same. Um, and I think close behind that, some experience in in, in some public, either public uh, facing activity, because there is a lot of public uh, activities. I testified 48 times in Congress. So whether that's in government or some other place where you have to deal with uh, communication of that sort, uh, those, those are the most important things. And you might say, well, what about tax? Um, honestly, you know, you, you know, the, the IRS has, has 1600 lawyers who are ex experts in tax in every possible code section. The treasury has people, um, obviously anyone that would take a, an office has to have some level of exposure to tax. But I think that, um, you know, the, 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 the real, the real role of the IRS commissioner is to lead the agency and to direct the resources in the right way. And it can rely anyone that's there, even if you were a tax expert would only be a tax expert in some section, you would have to rely on people for the most part to do that. Um, so that's, that's my feeling. Um, and I think that, um, uh, uh, the uh, era period of the uh, restructuring commission in 1998, which I think uh, Jeff Trinka was part of, and some of these people here were part. Of, that was part of what they what they uh, recommended as well. And you um, you mentioned your your nonprofit that you're working that you started, shrink the tax gap. Um, can you tell us a little more about how that came about? I know you're working with former some former commissioners and sort of um, how you guys put that sort of um, put that in place and started working. Uh, brought that about? Sure. So as I said, in, 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 in just what I my remarks now, um, I was really not involved in any way in anything about taxes, you know, for almost 15 years. I started to look at what was happening, as I said, you know, around the time of the presidential campaigns and all that. And I just became very uh, surprised. And so I started, eventually I wrote an article in tax notes, you know, that was what I did. And uh, I was surprised that it got a lot of interest. It had some recommendations about how to modernize the IRS. Um, and so that led to different people like Fred Goldberg and some of my other colleagues like Fred Foreman, who was a former associate commissioner and, and just a sort of an informal group of people that kind of got on the train, um, of, uh, recommending that, you know, the IRS be supported for a long-term program, modernize, improve technology, figure out how to, how to do a better job. And the administration, when they came in, picked up some of those themes and, uh, some people that we had talked to uh, on the outside came into the treasury. And uh, so that's kind of, then we just basically set, we finally said, we were talking to a lot of people informally. We just finally just set up a website and gave it a name. That's about it. But yes, then from there, I was asked to testify a couple of times. And, you know, you can now go on the site if you want to shrink the tax gap.com. And there's a whole lot of material on there about uh, what we've recommended. Other people have recommended, you know, different news articles. There's dozens of articles that have been written. And uh, we're hoping that what it'll end up with is something that uh, Congress does to, as I say, provide some funding and clear direction and modernize the workforce, modernize the technology, and um, move on to what the agency really needs to serve the public. And as um, IRS has gone through some of these problems, especially when you look at, at some of the stuff that's come out of Congress, the taxpayer advocate role has been pretty prominent. Um, you know, um, she will often, uh, the current taxpayer advocate, Lisa Collins, has testified several times and sort of made recommendations and, and always makes big headlines. And then I know there's sort of the, the, the staff that works on individual problems on behalf of taxpayers. How do you, um, how do you view that office? Is it, is it when, you know, when you're an IRS commissioner, is it sort of a thorn in your side? Or can it be constructive? And um, do you well, think it helps push? Yeah, I mean, I, I was actually there. I mean, there was a, there was a sort of a nascent taxpayer advocate uh, group in some of the districts when I got there. But as part of the restructuring act, they they actually uh, made it a much more a significant organization and more in the form as it is today. And I I actually was the one that appointed Nina Olson, who was the preceder to this taxpayer advocate, who was there for twenty years, and she's still a good friend of mine. 
Um, yes, they're a thorn, uh, but they're supposed to be. But it's a constructive thorn uh, because they really do. Uh, I think if you look at that annual report to Congress, they lay it out in chapter and verse. And uh, not everything that they can recommend is, is doable quickly. And of course, some of the problems are really uh, possible to solve without more budget resources and staff resources. But I think they do. And I think Aaron, the current taxpayer, I've done a great job in highlighting these problems. And if you look, to, listen to her, she's pretty, um, she's pretty, uh, you know, tough, but she's also fair. I mean, she, she's, she's outlining what the source of these problems is. But the problem, if I could just make one other comment about it, is you can outline, and they do a great job, a long list of the 10 most important problems that that can be solved. And some of those can be solved, you know, to some degree by short-term actions. But honestly, you really can't solve them in any big way without getting to the root causes, to the, to the foundation. And without that, you know, that's the technology, that's the workforce, that's long-term improvements in how you do business. Absolutely. And I know, I know you talked about funding and management and workforce. And one of the one of the fears out there is, well, you can throw a lot of money at this at, at these problems, but it doesn't necessarily fix them. Um, but I, th at the same time, I think you probably can't fix them without money. Well, um, most of those statements are true. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you could throw a lot of money at it and not fix them. That's that's true. And that's why I think the, if they if they do provide any funding, they need to be very clear on what the goals are and, and, and have. Uh, and I think the oversight board, if they can reconstitute that, could be a helpful uh, vehicle to, to provide the right kind of guidance, um, you know, on a more daily basis. Um, but, um, but at the same time, I mean, what is clear is that what has been done over the last 25 years, which is to say, oh, well, we'll just cut it a little bit every year. It won't make any difference. That has not worked. That has got us into really serious trouble. Yeah. There, a question came in on ID.me. I don't know how closely you followed this, but there was some some uproar in Congress a couple months ago around the facial recognition. And then um, they did come out last week and said they would, you know, uh, folks would continue to be required to um, register through ID.me, but, but they wouldn't have the facial recognition piece. Um, right. And some folks have said, you know, their, their privacy concerns or whatever. I don't know if you have any, any thoughts on. Yeah. On well, that. I don't want to get into specifics because I obviously don't have the data to do that, but um, I think that, in a broader sense, um, this is an example of an attempt to do something that is very important and, and very useful, but not thinking it through, you know, as carefully as that needs to be. Anything that you do in the IRS that uses tech, and you do have to use new technology. I don't know whether it's ID.me or something, but this type of technology is being widely deployed everywhere. And yes, there are privacy concerns. There are issues anytime you have anything that touches a large number of people, which the IRS does. So it means that you have to have a cross-agency process that is very carefully, carefully managed and often done in small steps, you know, rather than one big step, just to check it out and things like that. And for whatever reason, it appears that, you know, that was not done, but we cannot at the same time draw the conclusion that therefore, you know, throw up our hands, we're never going to use new technology. We just have to do it more carefully and, you know, in, 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 in increments that, that can be checked and tested before you, uh, before you try to spread it too big, too widely. Yep. We had a question come in from David Talith, who's the chairman of the, the board at NAEA. He said, why would anyone take on the position of IRS commissioner without adequate support from the outside, Congress and the tax industry community it seems like an impossible task to make a difference in IRS performance. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, my, I don't know why I took it. I mean, I, <laughs> at the time, you might not remember, but the IRS was, you know, under serious attack at the time I did. I think there are people who will, you know, I, I used to say I, I took it on because I did People said, is it a suicide mission? I said, no, I don't go to take suicide mission. I think it was very challenging. You couldn't be sure of success. But if there was enough, if you thought you had enough level of commitment from uh, uh, the, the administration and other constituents um, that you were willing to take a risk, 
I think there are a lot of public, maybe a lot, a lot, but there are enough public spirited people in today's world or any world uh, that they would take that on. I mean, people do take on challenging assignments. I do agree with um, the speaker. I'm sorry, I forgot the name, but um, the questioner that you do, at least when I was there, I did do my due diligence before I took the job to see if I had some level of commitment um, in the key places. <laughs> and I concluded that it was maybe not perfect, but but at least enough to get started. And you know, remember, we did they did pass the the Restructuring and Reform Act, and they did provide some authorities, and, and that was very helpful. I will say, even then, we never did get the funding that we needed. I'd be interested in your on your your view of the relationship between IRS and Treasury. From a from an advocacy standpoint, it's always interesting because you have lots of political appointees at Treasury folks that sort of, you know, change out with each administration and, and, and sort of have uh, their agenda or things they want to accomplish. And then IRS tends to, you know, has very, for, for obvious reasons that they put in place, has very few political appoint, appointees, right. only, you know, two, I think. Right. Um, but I know that, you know, technically Treasury is under IRS, but IRS has a, a level of independence. And I, I'd just be curious of that interaction in terms of yeah. having to answer to Treasury or them setting direction for, for yeah. the IRS. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that, that that is a very important relationship. When I took the job, that was one of the main things I wanted to look into. And it, I think that there are, um, you have to be confident that if you're going to be take the job as IRS commissioner, that you have a proper relationship of support from the, from the secretary and the deputy secretary, who are the two primary uh people you know that make decisions there are others tax policy and sometimes they have and um i was fortunate that they had an individual in the position of assistant secretary for management who was very very experienced and very helpful so that's just one of the relationships that you have to have um if you're going to be successful and uh i mean if you're accustomed to running in any big organization you have either a board of director, you have, you have something like that, you know, that you have to deal with. It's part of your management, but you do have to check it out before you get into it. Any advice to enrolled agents out there that are, that are sort of addressing problems at, at IRS or just on the advocacy front? I mean, they're obviously working through NAEA and we have our own, you know, advocacy agenda that, that they're supporting, but any advice as folks try to be helpful as public citizens and oh, as gee. professionals. I mean, I, as I said, I think you're, on the on the broad level and the collective level, I think your white paper is is well is well done, and I think to the extent that you can advocate for it, and on a day to day basis, I mean, look, you're part of the tax system. I mean, you keep it together. You know, you 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 help the taxpayers, and you know, you're sort of an intermediary that in bad times at least helps to keep it together. And so the only thing I could say is persevere. You know. Um, but on a broad level, if, if you can advocate as you are for providing some resources and guidance and proper oversight, but the proper oversight uh, and proper resources to rebuild the agency, uh, that will stead, not be in good stead for you as well as the taxpayers. Just be aware that it's not going to be a quick fix. There is no quick fix. There's a good question that came in. It said, um, from Jerry Gaddis, would it be possible to speak to IRS technology? There are so many stories about how old and inefficient it is um, that the service is looking for COBOL and Pascal programmers. Is, the, is any of this remotely true? Yes, it's true. Um, it's absolutely true. But let me, let me be careful because I want a, a very, very important point about IRS, which is something that I've written, my and my colleagues in Shrink the Tax Gap have written a, a whole book about, uh, not a book, but a long article about how you can do this technology. It, the IRS tax accounting systems uh, that do the basic processing of tax returns, you know, have, were started in the 1960s and have been updated every year since. And they are very old and very fragile technology. Um, and over time, they have been updated to some degree, but um, they, they need a lot more to be updated. But what is an incorrect conclusion is to draw from that the idea that you have to wait until you replace all that technology until you can make any improvements using new technology, because that's not true. Every organization has 
old technology, I mean, every large organization that I've ever been involved with has an, an installed base of old technologies, maybe not as old as the IRS. And it takes years to replace that and it takes a lot of money. But in the meantime, I mean, think about it. If everybody in, in a bank or everybody in a retail organization had to replace all their accounting systems before they set up a good website, you know, we wouldn't have very many websites. Um, you know, we wouldn't be doing business over the internet. And so you can do both at the same time if you have the resources. It has to be managed carefully. But the IRS has already done, you know, done, done some things. I mean, and, and, you know, we know about them. I mean, it does electronic filing, for example, is if you didn't have electronic filing, we'd be really in trouble. You do have websites that, although they're not as good as they, they can be, they have a lot of information on them. And to some degree, you can check things like refunds. They are sort of at the process of getting self-service accounts. All of these kinds of things can be done at the same time. So you have to think of it as two paths. One path is you're gradually replacing this old technology. And the other path is you're providing new services using new technology to, to your existing customers. And that's what creates the management challenge. But every organization has it to some degree. It's not unique to the IRS. The only thing that's unique about the IRS is how, is how, how, how big and how bad let's say, or how old the, 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 the core technology is. But, um, but that problem is not unique to the IRS. Yep. And you talk about electronic filing. That's obviously, you know, expanded a lot the last decade or two, and, and, and they're doing pretty well in some parts. But then there are other things like an amended return, like you want to yeah. file an amended 941, yeah. it has to be yeah. on paper. I know. Which- which yeah. folks uh, yeah. felt the well, pain. I mean, that's that's an example. I mean, you have you, you got you got all the way. Well, the other thing about it is the backlog of paper returns. People have been talking about for paper returns that are print that are filed. Uh, I'm sorry, prepared on a computer. You know, you're never going to get a hundred percent of all returns filed electronically. There's always going to be some issue. I mean, I know myself I tried to file. There's one year I couldn't file because it was some odd. But you know, in the meantime, what you can do is you have this thing where you can print a barcode on on the paper and a return and scan it in. And it's, a, it's not as good as electronic, but it's 10 times better than sending in a paper. So there's, there's things that can be done if you if you're manage it effectively and you have resources. But I can tell you that every one of those things that you could do is without resources. And I, I, even 20 years ago, I had 100 things that I could have done like that, that I just couldn't do because I didn't have the budget to do it. So it's not only about budget, but, but without the budget, you, you just can't do it. Yep. Yep. I, I, there was a TIGDA report that came out, I think it was earlier this week, that talked about the need for sort of universal electronic filing or making it universally available. And um, it said that uh, and the, the IRS, that was one of the recommendations the IRS agreed with and said they're working on, but they said they didn't have a good handle on, on some of the, on where it wasn't offered or they weren't aware of all the things where it wasn't offered, which I know raised some eyebrows that um, yeah. they, um, yeah. so we had a, um, sort of a question comment come in from Richard Og um, about the examples you gave around funding dating back to the early 1990s, sort of the yeah. um, mm-hmm. funding problems. He said, can we get a copy of that or is it no, on the shrink It's, the it's all on the website. website. Everything, okay. everything I said is on the website. Yeah. You, can, you can go in chapter and verse and just go into, I mean, as a matter of fact, there's um, uh, a whole set of, exhi- I think there's 17 different exhibits if you look into the section of the website that's exhibits, it's got spreadsheets that show all these numbers. Uh, I don't know which exhibit that was in, but you can find it easily. Uh, there's also a news archive on there that has all these different articles that we published uh, and publications. So everything is there, shrinkthetaxgap.com. Great, and I see we just posted it in the, um, in the chat, uh, the website. Um, well, I guess, you know, as a final question, I'll say, um, not to put you on the spot on this, but are you optimistic? Are you optimistic about uh, the ability of, um, <laughs> of uh, you know, to turn the corner on this? And I know, you know, with all of these political problems and government problems, the, the problem is, is it does get political. You do have to go through Congress, you know, uh, things get taken out of context. Um, but, you know, I think that there's also a lot of bipartisan support for you know, trying to fix these problems. So, yeah. um, well, I, I uh, let me put it this way: I am optimistic that if Congress provided the funding and the authority and the correct uh, goals and you know clear guidance, 
they can be fixed. Not quickly, but over time they can be. Uh, I, I know they can be, I'm, I'm sure of that. What I don't know is how it's gonna play out. I mean, the administration is politically and in Congress. I know the administration is still trying pretty hard, very hard actually, to get uh, a long, some sort of long-term funding bill through and some other authorities. I know that there are many members that I've talked to that are supportive of that. And by the way, even on the Republican side, although they, you know, it's <laughs> difficult to get anything bipartisan, but in terms of support for the idea, yes. But uh, I don't know whether it's gonna happen um, uh, in, in this Congress or, or what might happen, but if they can get something through that provides some funding, provides some authority, provides some guidance, uh, I think that um, they will be able to recruit a, a next term commissioner when this term ends and get somebody to do it that can do it. But whether all that's going to come together, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot of stuff that has to come together. Well, and as you've, as you've mentioned, I think a lot of the things in the NAEA white paper really echo the, the same ideas that you're pushing. And so we look forward to continuing to, you know, work together for these um, uh, to make progress and, and hopefully we will get some traction. But Michelle, I don't know if you wanted to say anything in closing, but, um, or if, if you had anything else to say in cl closing commissioner, but we really, really appreciate you, uh, right. you coming today. And this was um, really interesting. And I know folks uh, on the ground that are actually out there sort of dealing with these problems every day, dealing with taxpayers and the IRS appreciate it as well. Sure, I'm to happy to do it. I just want to say thank you and thank you for your website, shrinkthetaxgap.com. That's outstanding. Yeah. Well, thanks for your, I'm glad you did your white paper because it's very aligned, uh, you know, very much aligned. I think if you read the stuff on our website and look at your paper, I mean, it's not exact, but you'll see that in broad terms, it's, it's quite, quite aligned. Great. Well, thank you very much. And, sure. and maybe sometime we'll have you back in person. Okay. Sure. We, we have a conference or something. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Michelle, we can stay on a minute if we, I know there were some questions about the EA fee and stuff like that. If we want to, you know, take a, take a few minutes to talk about that stuff. Sure. Um, which by the way, I thought that was great. I didn't want to, you know, ask him to overstay his, his, uh, his welcome, but the, or, or, you know, take too much of his time, but uh, I thought that was a real treat to get to to hear oh. from him. He's such a smart sort of, you know, um, impressive guy. And he obviously lived through all this and is still trying to, to do good at the IRS. Well, as, as you know, and uh, uh, most of the members may know that today, Meg Killian, our executive vice president, testified at the IRS user fee hearing um, and uh, made a strong case for why um, these user fees maybe need to be looked at again. Um, we are the FOIA uh, request that you all, that you helped put in um, really spit back a lot of information that raised big questions. I think on you know how they can raise the the uh, fees as much as they have since uh, from thirty dollars in twenty nineteen to a proposed one hundred and forty dollars now. Uh, ridiculous. So anyway. Right, yeah. Yeah, I see that the first question that that David Rasley said, um, and I thought my thought was we would get to this, now, you know, once the commissioner um, got off, he said, has the group or the NA NAEA made any advocacy effort to reduce the recent IRS fee increase um, from $67 to $140? And to Michelle's point, yes, this has been a priority. Um, a, a few things I'll note. One, there was an op-ed um, about a month ago, I think that was in Bloomberg Tax um, that NAEA published uh, sort of making the case that this increase was you know, not called for, it was too big and, um, and the services didn't really match you know, the increase, the services that enrolled agents are getting. And then a comment letter was uh, submitted. Last Monday was the deadline for comment letters. And so, um, NAEA submitted a thorough comment letter sort of making all the arguments um, about uh, the fee increase. And then um, as Michelle mentioned, there was also a FOIA request where NAEA FOIA Freedom of Information Act 
requested all the documents from the IRS that went in to the calculations of making this um, making this decision, and um, and so that information was received. It was actually received after the comment letter uh, due date, um, but before the public comments today. So Meg was able to um, to uh, talk about some of those numbers that came back and and they they gave us 280 pages and only a few days to go through them but we were able to make the case that some of the numbers didn't really um didn't really add up and um and then uh so that testimony meg did a great job on the testimony this morning um before the irs um one of the arguments that we made and we were actually able to do a, a separate meeting with irs and treasury and the sba last week that the Small Business Administration um, set up for us is whenever there's a proposed rule, um, there's a, a law called the Regulatory Flexibility Act. And an agency has to look at, at if, the, if the proposed rule has a significant impact on a substantial number of small businesses, um, then there's this whole analysis that the agency has to go through to say, well, are there alternatives? Is this, are there things we can do to make this less harmful to small businesses? Um, but uh, an agency can certify, no, this doesn't have a significant impact on a substantial number of small businesses. And so that's what the IRS did in their proposed rule. They said, these aren't small businesses, these are individuals. And so we're, um, you know, this doesn't apply. And so the case that we made um, to the SBA and then ultimately to IRS and Treasury was, you can't say that an enrolled agent's not a small business. These are, um, you know, many enrolled agents employ um, either support staff or other enrolled agents. Uh, many are sole proprietors, which are still small businesses. And then you have uh, firms that you know go all the way up to, to larger firms, um, but are still sort of under that small business definition. And so um, there was a case made that um, you know the, that more analysis should have been done about the impact of raising these fees on small businesses. And if you look at the actual size of the increase, it went from 30, you know, $30 to in 2019, as Michelle said, to a proposed uh, $140, which is a, I think it's like a over a 460% increase um, when you look at it back to 2019. So, um, you know, NAEA has been making the case, you know, folks, we know folks at Treasury and IRS have been listening because we've been on the calls with them, whether they're actually, you know, um, it's going to change the rule uh, is unclear, you know, or change the fee to reduce it a little bit is unclear at this point. We we definitely wouldn't want to get anybody's hopes up because, you know, at the at the hearing this morning there were zero questions asked by the by the Treasury and IRS folks, uh, which wasn't super promising. Um, but the the case a strong case has definitely been made that um, that this was um, you know an excessive increase. And I think I saw a comment come through about the, um, uh, about whether they should be charging user fees at all. Um, believe the course determined that user fees are limited to the actual cost of administering the program. They're not to be profit centers. Yep, so that's, that's a good point. And then, you know, there are circumstances where they don't even have to charge a user fee if it really benefits the public. And so we made that argument as well that we didn't have that be our sole argument because we knew that it, it hadn't gotten a lot of traction in the past. Um, but we did include that argument that, that the role of EAs is not just a benefit to EAs, it's a benefit to the general public, it's a benefit to the IRS. And, um, and so, um, you know, really they shouldn't be charging any fee. Um, but we kind of, that was one of, one of many arguments because I think at the end of the day, uh, it's the size of the increase that has frustrated um, a lot of folks. It's easy for them to say, well, it's not that much money, but, you know, over three years, it doesn't add up to that much. But, but the reality is, is the increase is 400, you know, 460% or, or whatever it is, is, is definitely mm -hmm. significant. Um, and then I know I saw Meg put in the, the chat to please share the white paper. So the white paper that the commissioner, you know, we sent that to the commissioner in advance and he read it and, and got back to us and was like, great white paper. So it was, it was, I was happy to see that he was engaged on, on the white paper. And um, 
we have you know shared it with some folks on the hill um, but we're going to continue pushing that out and uh, i know it was in the e-alert on friday um, but if folks have um, you know um, uh, an opportunity to read that and then even more so an opportunity to share it uh, with with uh, you know your local congressmen or or other policymakers that have something to do with the IRS that you might be interacting with, um, we think uh, you know it's a it's a strong message. It is a white paper, so it's you know it's not a one pager. But we're going to be doing more stuff to kind of break it up into little pieces um, to uh, to get that message out. So there'll be more to come on that. It's not just going to end with the white paper. We'll continue kind of pushing pushing the various messages and in smaller pieces. Um, and let me see if there are any other comments coming in that we should that we should answer to. And you know, in terms of in terms of I'll just give a quick update on on Congress. Um, you know, we made it through the um, the FY22 appropriation cycle. They they finally passed a bill where we saw IRS get a small bump up, but they're already starting it for, for FY23. Um, and so that process is happening. The IRS commissioner testified last Wednesday before the, um, before, uh, the appropriations committee that was in, in the e-alert and, um, and you know, got a lot of the same questions that you would expect about backlogs or you, you know, he talked about some of the hiring they're doing, which it seems like they have had some success and hiring folks to deal with the backlog. Um, but one of the questions was, are you really be, gonna be able to get through these backlogs by the end of the year? And kind of reminding him that that was the, um, that that was the, the, the promise that was made. And so, um, you know, on sort of some of those challenges and some of that testimony, it was, it was more of the same, but, um, but this next budget cycle, we're kind of back at it, trying to push the message um, of all of these themes around, not just additional funding, but better service, better technology. Um, and uh, it's an election year, obviously. So I think, you know, there, there are also a lot of retiring members of Congress that want to try to get something done before they leave. And so I think the, the, the most likely scenario, if everything goes well, is that they, they pass some kind of budget by the end of the um, calendar year. So probably after the election, but, um, but before the new year. Um, the, the actual fiscal year starts on um, October 1, but a lot of times they do these short-term short -term extensions. And, um, and, um, and then the elections is a whole nother, you know, can of worms that we're obviously watching closely to see how that might impact the, the committees that we work with and, and some of the policies that, that come out of Congress. Um, but with that, I don't wanna just uh, filibuster here, Michelle. I, uh, Maybe we can give folks a few minutes of their time back. Um, Matt, there is a question or I guess kind of a comment in the chat from Richard Ogg. Uh, is NAEA asking members for some form of coordinated outreach to our Congress representatives? Do you want us to send the white paper? Do we quote some of the numbers? You know, what would you like uh, for the members to do? Yeah, so there hasn't been a formal action plan on that yet. We've, um, you know, I, I know that uh, we said share it if you're sort of have the opportunity to. Um, but we do have a government relations committee meeting um, next Wednesday. Uh, that'll be the first one since we've kind of firmed up this white paper. And so I think that is a good topic that we'll probably take back to the committee and see, you know, there, I think there, there's one thing to share the white paper, which I, I don't think it's a bad idea, but we've also talked about some more, you know, innovative ways it's hard to even get a congressional tax policy staffer sometimes to sit down and read the whole white paper, you know? Um, and so we've talked about some more innovative ways to get this message out. Um, and so I would say, you know, if you happen to be meeting with your congressman or have the opportunity to share this, by all means, share it. Um, but we will, we will take this up before the Government Relations Committee and try to think of some more innovative ways to distribute it and the message and also an action plan. So folks have something a little more concrete to, um, to go off of. So I appreciate, appreciate that comment. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I see someone said they we, we reposted it, you know, the white paper on Twitter. That kind of thing is is always great. Just sort of getting the word out. Um, with that, I don't know, Aaron, if you had any announcements on the next, um, any upcoming programming you wanted to uh, to flag or. Well, sure. So thanks for again passing the mic that. Um, I'll just close out uh, with the date of our next um, GR update. So uh, for everyone um, who's on the call, we do these quarterly uh, moving forward and we're trying to you know, let the members know kind of what NAEA is working on um, and what is happening at the IRS. So the next one, if you want to mark your calendars, is going to be on July 13th. Uh, but we will, of course, send um, notifications out and registration is not open yet. So we will put that out in emails um, and give everyone the date. Uh, Michelle, do you have anything to close us out with? Just to mention that July 13th is my birthday. So that's a perfect day for another yeah. GR update. Well, wonderful. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you everyone uh, for your participation today and your interest in NAEA's government relations work. Uh, this concludes today's program. The recording will be posted on YouTube at a later date. Uh, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Great. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate Bye it. Now.